Hello, you're listening to a special hour-long edition of The Conversation, a place where women from different countries meet to talk openly and frankly about their lives. I'm Kim Chakaneta, here at the Global Philanthropy Forum's annual conference, just outside San Francisco. Now, all morning long, I've been listening to people talking about giving. This is a place where wealth and civic responsibility meet. With people from 98 countries getting together every year to look at who they should be giving to. And I'm delighted to have with me two women who've given away, to put it bluntly, piles of their own cash. Now, I'll be honest, it wasn't exactly easy to find out just how much money my two guests have given. When it comes to that level of wealth, well, people can be a little bit cagey, or shall I say, shy about numbers. But what I do know is that these are women who give generously and regularly, and I'd like to know who they choose to give to and why, and to also explore whether philanthropy sometimes does more harm than good. And I'm sure my two guests will be excellent guides. They are the Zimbabwean philanthropist and social entrepreneur, Tsitsi Masiwa. Tsitsi is the co-founder and co-chair of the High Life Foundation that has sent thousands of children to school and to university over the past 20 years. And I should mention that Tsitsi and her husband, Strive Masiwa, are members of the Giving Pledge. Now that's known for being an elite club of mostly billionaires who've signed up to give away at least half of their wealth. And Titi will be speaking to Amy Rao, the co-founder and CEO of Silicon Valley data management company, Integrated Systems Archive. Amy is a prolific philanthropist and fundraiser for a variety of causes. She's also the chair of the Human Rights Watch Voices for Justice event in San Francisco. Amy gives away more than a million dollars every year. Also listening in and hopefully joining in today's conversation are some of the people attending the forum. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, personally, I know a lot of women who give to their communities, um, not huge sums of money, but they give informally without much fanfare. But what makes someone a philanthropist, um, Titi? Is it about the amount of money they give? You know what? I'll start, Kim, by talking about myself. I'm motivated to give because it's something that is personally very meaningful to me. It's something that I believe in. I believe it's part of my purpose and something that I love doing. And I, I see it as a great opportunity to express myself through giving. So it's not about the piles of money. In fact, when I started uh, my work, I didn't know it was called philanthropy. I observed so many problems in my community. And I asked myself if ever I had the opportunity to make a difference, to do something, what would I do? I said, well, if I had money, I would give it. And I would give it uh, especially to kids, uh, orphaned and vulnerable children, because AIDS and HIV and AIDS were just, people were dying. This, was, this was in this Zimbabwe. Was, it's, yeah, in Zimbabwe, where um, I'm originally from. But I saw people die. I saw I lost members of my family, people I loved dearly. We had one university, and I saw my classmates die. So just that enough was, you know, it, it was something that made me question myself. What can I do? Amy? What makes a philanthropist? That's such a great question. I think about it, and I, and I don't think it has anything to do with the amount of money that you can give away. So I think I, I, I almost kind of shy away from the word philanthropist because sometimes I worry that it's almost a – an elitist word or something that people won't feel that they can attain. And just from listening to what you said, we address giving money away as a privilege. Mm. It's not, um, does it make us special? And in fact, we probably would agree that the people that we get to support through um, our philanthropy are the special people, mm. and we're lucky mm. uh, because we actually are in this position in our life when we have the ability to give money away, which means we have more than we need to feed ourselves or take care of our own family. And so so I think you can be a philanthropist at, at any amount. And, and I think about growing up in a small town in, in rural Indiana where, where we were very poor, but, you know, my parents would give away little things like uh, shoes from the shoe store or something, and and I guess that was it. it that's philanthropy at at any level, mm -hmm. whatever someone can do when they give of themselves, and and philanthropy should be able to be time and money and and not just um, you know a sizable check. Mm -hmm. 
And City, in terms of you growing up in Zimbabwe, was you said that you didn't know that word philanthropy, but was giving something that was um, that your parents used to do. Were they in any way um, involved in that sort of thing? Most certainly. I grew up in a a very generous community. Now, when I was five years old, uh, my mother left to go and study in the UK. I always say my mother was born at the wrong time. She was very ambitious. You know, she had dreams. But the people around her didn't understand what her desires were. So at least her husband understood. So they agreed that she could leave the family five girls and go and study in the UK. She wanted to be a medical doctor. And uh, she ended up not being a medical doctor, but did a lot of nursing uh, courses. But she ended up as a state registered nurse. But when she was away, I recall my grandmother coming to visit and always coming with a parcel, something special for us to eat. I always remember my aunts used to come and visit us. The people around us in the community were aware that it was my dad raising us. So there was always somebody knocking at the door to do something kind and do something generous. And then also what happened in the community, everybody went to church. So the church community also uh, was very giving, very kind and very generous. The school community. So that kind of generosity for me was so embedded in my community and in my society. Is this something that you can recognize, Amy? What is he saying? Yeah, I, I recognize kind of having a house where we didn't have a lot, but we shared what we had. And so, you know, I look back on my childhood and I realize, wow, how really poor I was growing up, but I never realized I was poor. I mean, I would look back on it now and know that, you know, when when the heat got turned off or, you know, you didn't have lunch money or you couldn't take the newspaper or you had to get a second job when you're, you know, 10 years old and why we had to do those things. Mm. And now I look back and think, oh, my gosh, you know, it was such a different life than what I live now or what I see. But what I take out of it is, you know, how much you just want to help anyone you can to just give that extra leg up to make the stress of not being able to pay for school or the stress of not having food on the table or just to ease that burden in any way you can. And I love that your dad had five girls. I'm the youngest of three girls. Where are you in the five? Number five. Oh, my baby. goodness. <laughs> so we're the same. We're the same. <laughs> Babies are a good thing. How many years was your mother gone? 14 years. 14 yes. years. Yes, yeah. So, uh, but what's interesting, you know, she, she was pretty special in that she paid my school fees. Okay. So although she wasn't there physically, she earned much more than my dad because she was earning in pounds. And so I went to a really great school. So did all my sisters. We got a really great education because on one hand, we had a dad who was a school headmaster and who told us, you five girls, if you don't get an education, you're going to walk the streets selling your bodies for money. So that was a scary thought. And we worked hard. I wasn't that smart, but we worked extremely hard. <laughs> what about yourself? Um, I grew up with in an incredible household, the youngest of three girls. And um, my parents were always around. They never traveled. My dad had a little local shoe store in this little town where we grew up. And my mom worked there part of the time. And then she was a social worker. And then in the evenings, um, she worked for an auctioneer. So she would, like, during the week, get prepared for the auctions that would take place on Saturday and Sunday. So she sort of worked seven days a week. And But it, when I was five, I went to kindergarten half day. My kindergarten was in the afternoon. So every morning I would be at the shoe store with my parents. And by the time I was seven, um, you know, a man or woman could come into the store. I knew how to measure your foot. Um, I knew if you were asking for a wingtip or if you were, you know, you needed a nurse's shoe or, you know, I knew where to get it. I was really, you know, I'm still not uh, blessed with height, um, but I was really small back then. And uh, so I remember I'd have to scoot the chair that we would sit on to change someone's shoes so that I could climb up the wall to get the shoe boxes down. I knew that you had to answer the phone on the third ring and never make a customer wait. Like all these things I learned about running a business from, and you know, the shoe salesman when they would come four or five times a year and helping my dad pick out the shoes and the sizes and what colored women would like. And so I've been working pretty, I mean, since I was quite young. My business, I really owe the success to just, you know, all the things I learned from my parents growing up and having a work ethic and um, and growing up in an entrepreneurial house where you just assume that everyone goes on to be entrepreneurs. That's how people make a life. But did you have, is your, are your parents still alive? No, my mom uh, passed away. In fact, she, 
she came back because she was not well. She had cancer. So she came, uh, we lived with her for five years and then she passed on. Then my dad, I have to tell you a funny story. When she died, my dad said, you know what, I don't think I'm going to live any longer because uh, I love my wife so much. He went on to live for another 30 years. <laughs> now he had bought a, 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 his uh, uh, a graveside yeah. next to her. <laughs> so after 10 years, the council, you bought the graveside from the council, they wrote to me and said, listen, are you still alive or not? Because we'd love to give the space to somebody else. <laughs> but they were patient with him, so he still was able, 30 years later, to keep his graveside. <laughs> Amy, now you've gone on to build a very successful um, business in Silicon Valley here in California um, during the dot-com boom of the 90s. And Amy, when you, as your business became more and more successful, when did you decide that you were going to give away money? Oh, the first month. Actually, the first month I opened my business in June 1994. And um, I opened it. I got my copy of QuickBooks. And I remember in the first month kind of looking at what had taken place as far as income coming in and and, uh, dollars going out and saying, wow, I just made more this month than I'd made in a whole year. In fact, I'd made more in that first month than I ever thought I would ever make in my best year of my life because this was not... I couldn't even dream of this life. And so I started giving um, money away right away. I really got active, though, when my oldest, who's now 24, went to kindergarten in Palo Alto. She was five years old. And I remember going to this public school and being so surprised, you know, that our science program was being cut back and music and arts were being cut back and trying to understand, like, why that was being cut back. Oh, because there wasn't funding for it. Well, where does the funding come from? And then sort of connecting all these dots on something I'd never really paid attention to before. And, um, and that's when my philanthropy started. Tsitsi, you were married to um, Strive Masiwa, as you explained, and he's a very well-respected um, businessman uh, in Zimbabwe, and he's one of the richest men in Zimbabwe and in Africa overall. <laughs> Don't look surprised. Um, now, how he built his successful telecoms business has become something of a legend in um, business circles um, because you went through a very lengthy and difficult ordeal because you applied for a telecoms license for the company Econet, but the government refused, and they had the monopoly. And then you sued the government, and um, you went through a very hard time. Can you remember what was the lowest point um, during that period? You know, it's not every day you sue the government, especially uh, in our part of the world. So, um, first of all, I told my husband, don't do it. He said he was going to do it, and I asked, how long do you think the whole legal process will take? He said three months. So on that basis, I said, okay, I I hold my peace. In three months' time, life goes back to normal. He said, yes. Well, it didn't take three months. It took five years. And we lost everything. We lost money. The lowest point was, you know, realizing that we were seemingly alone. And we lost the, the people who we thought were very dear to us. But what we found, both Strive and I, are, our faith is, is central to our lives. You know, uh, we are both Christians and really use the Bible as a source of wisdom, as a source of, of, of encouragement. So we found our faith being very central in helping us to come out of despair and hopelessness. So the deepest point, I think, was just realizing we had no, nowhere to run to. We didn't have money. There was no country we could run to. We felt, well, I felt really stuck. And I remember in my deepest moments, I thought, hmm, surely it's better to die than to live. I didn't try to commit suicide, <laughs> but I know I got to a point where it was so dark that I thought it was better to die than to live because I didn't see hope. Uh, ahead of me but you know out of that very in that very dark moment I think because of my faith I woke up one morning and realized that I was very privileged in that the persecution we're going through was physical but the government couldn't take away my heart and my mind so I think out of that dark period that darkness came out this great um I believe opportunity to say to myself, okay, 
what if one day we do get the license and we do start the business and we do make some money? What do you do with the money? Because you can only sleep in one bed, drive one car, <laughs> and live in one home. And, uh, and like I said, you know, the awareness of the people dying around me became even greater as I saw how privileged I was compared to the kids who were losing their parents. I didn't wait to make money. The license came five years later, but uh, in 1998. But 1996 is when I sponsored 12 kids to uh, go to school. And I must be honest with you, the 12 kids actually didn't exist. Uh, I met an old man who said he had lost 12 children from AIDS, and I believed him. I didn't check. Wow. And it turned out, after we had been supporting him for a year, that the kids actually didn't exist. He was, he was just collecting money, uniforms, and what have you. But it didn't put me off. I think I, I just learned a, a hard lesson that, you know, just check your facts before you, you do your giving. But it didn't put me off uh, the vision that I had that one day, you know what, when things are okay, when we've got a little bit of money, I'm going to take that and change people's lives and give as many kids as I can, you know, some opportunity to get an education. What would you say to cynics um, who say that philanthropists are just trying to mitigate the guilt of having so much money or the rising resentment um, because of the income inequality? Um, what would you say to them, Amy? Oh, I think that's actually just silly. Um, I, 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 it just makes no sense at all. If, um, the, if the thought of giving away money, we do it because we just want to feel better about inequality it it, it I, it just makes no sense at all and I don't even know of anyone that does that <coughs> because especially when you pay attention to the work and you, you want to get your fingers in the work and I love CC that you spend the night in these orphanages or schools I think that's absolutely incredible so that you actually wake up in the morning and you understand how that feels mm-hmm. you know I think about when I was in in Lesbos Greece in the fall and at nighttime, I'd go to my hotel room, and it was cold, and I just had a single blanket, and I was thinking about how cold I was, and then I was thinking about all the families that were sleeping outside with little kids and no blankets. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I, I think someone having that type of critique of people that give money away is maybe just their own way of dealing with the fact that they're not giving money away, and maybe it's a guilt factor. I don't know. I think it's just silly, though. It's not a fair critique. Mm-hmm. It's not fair. I think some, it can also be just ignorance, that because you, you, you don't have information. You think the world is as big as the way you see it, and I, I would encourage people like that that just step out and just get acquainted a little bit more with what different people are doing. There's no way you can come back with that same cynical attitude? Um, I think there are so many worthy causes. Education, sanitation. Mm -hmm. How do you pick what cause to give to, um, Amy? Oh, well, I can't think of a cause that isn't worthy. Um, Pretty much, you know, environment is so worthy and education is so worthy and human rights and health care, and they're all worthy. How do you pick? That's um, I, tr- I try, you know, I try to give where I can make a difference. And a lot of it is the organizations that you're giving to. So I, I'd say my, my uh, giving is really focused in human rights, and I love being able to support causes that work for long-term systemic change. Um, I also love local organizations or groups that are on the ground locally, mm-hmm. And then a a fair amount of my philanthropy is brought to me through friends um, that are on various boards or working with organizations that when you take the time and you hear about their work, it's incredible work. And and actually, there's just no silver bullet to solve the world's problems. It's going to be just all kinds of avenues. I try very hard to make sure that I'm giving to organizations that work for impact. I generally don't give to enormous organizations. I made an exception this past year and and, a supported a UNHCR effort for the refugees, but I normally look for groups that are a little bit smaller. And I love... Why is that, um, Amy? Um, because it's easier to sort of get to know the organization and to pull up their website, or or it's been introduced to me through a friend in my community. And so you get to know them, you spend a little time, you think, oh my God, they're doing incredible work. And I don't know so many you know really big 
organizations that are global, if they're not headquartered or in my backyard or they're not out here on a speaking circuit, you just don't, you know them through the newspaper or through their website, but you don't get the personal connection. Sissi, what about your choice to, um, in terms of who you decide to give to? Well, no, I started through by giving emotionally, not on the basis of a plan or research or anything like that, but it was just I felt deeply compelled in a particular area, which was education. I really personally felt education was the main way in which I could quickly uh, give assistance and bring change to, to, uh, to somebody. But then over the years, I've also learned there's going to be strategic giving uh, where uh, you, I may not have the expertise to do something in a particular area, or I may not have an interest, but it's a good cause. So you find somebody else who has a passion in that particular area and, and partner with them. So some of my giving is emotional. Some of it continues to be strategic. And then there's just ad hoc where there is a need. I don't need to be convinced. I don't need a plan. I don't need anything. It's just where you see somebody doing exceptionally great work and you give. Now, I mean, with the children that you're helping to educate, are you meeting them? I'm just trying to get a sense of how hands-on you are now. Well, when people ask how many kids do you have, sometimes I say, I I, I used to say, well, depending on the number of scholarships we are giving, then I would say I have 40,006 children. (laughs) Now they're 50,006. But um, I try as much as I can to get to hear their stories and where I can to mentor or to have a conversation. So I do it in different ways. Sometimes I go into, into the community, visit the kids, and eat what they eat, sleep where they sleep, because I think it keeps me grounded and down to earth. Okay, That's my kind of philanthropy, that go into the community, get to know, and get a taste of what actually happens on the ground. So with some of the kids, I do that. With others, WhatsApp is my favorite platform, so I'm talk, I talk to them on WhatsApp. Others, I, on every Saturday, we have a platform where we, um, via WebEx, we have a talk show, and I invite d- different people. I hope I can invite all of you to, <laughs> to participate in that. Now, bearing in mind, you know, we live in a country, uh, in Zimbabwe in particular, and some of the other countries we support, Lesotho, Burundi, where your ability and to express yourself and express your views is quite limited. So um, we try to use that pl- platform to encourage, you know, young people that we uh, give support to to talk about issues that are important to them. Just listening to you, I can see how philanthropy um, can be a force for good. But do you think it lets governments off the hook? Because you're essentially doing work that governments should be doing in many ways, um, Tizi. Not really. I don't believe the government is responsible for everything, personally. Where government institutions work, governments collect taxes and use those taxes for education, health, etc. But in some countries, either the systems of collection are so bad that not enough is collected, or there's so much corruption, or there are all sorts of limitations. So if we lived in a world where the government was responsible for everything, I think it would be a pretty dysfunctional world. I believe there's a role that governments play, and there's a role that individuals play and that generally there are more people who want to do something practical to positively change lives or to solve some of the social problems that we face. There are so many problems in the world, so many. And to look to a government to solve social problems, I think, is not smart and is not wise. Okay, but I'm thinking like somewhere like Zimbabwe, for example... Where you might find there's no medicine in the hospitals mm. or basics, even for school, children are unable to go to school because the teachers aren't paid. You don't think that the government has a role there, that they should be doing a little bit more at least, and well, that when NGOs come in, then they're just ceding that space. What has helped me uh, do what I do is I like to solve problems. If I sit and wait for the day when the government has things right, the formula is in place and they do what they're supposed to do, I think I'll go to my grave never having seen that. So I would rather go for the alternative. Do what you can do now. 
Now, I'm also a philanthropist who does not believe in let me get as much money as I can. When I retire, then I'll find a cause <laughs> to fund. It's let's, as you make the money, give it. As you make it, give it. Right? Why? Because the problems that we are facing are for now, and they need to be solved now. So uh, government has its role, but I'm not about to wait for governments to, to change the way they do business. <laughs> it's yeah, safer I, that way. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with you on that, CT. It, we have to do both. I think you have to have, and I think you'll always have to have both. You have to have a functioning government, or is, and to keep it hopefully functioning better and properly, you're going to take philanthropic work to both take the risk and drive the change and then be to put pressure on the government mm -hmm. to institute more change. If I can just add, you know, that as an African, where it's slightly, slightly more difficult to do your giving because sometimes governments are suspicious about your motive. And especially if larger the sums, the greater the questions and the attention, are you really, what is your ulterior motive? And what I found that's very crit critical to do is to find common ground. Set aside the things you don't like about what they do. Find the common ground that allows you not to lose focus on your goal, which is to help people. Titi, can I ask, do you have a story that you, of a child that you did a scholarship for that you're just incredibly proud of? One of my staff members came across a young man called Prince, appropriately named Prince. <laughs> and Prince was extremely intelligent, he had lost his dad, and the mom was quite poorly in health, so couldn't really earn an income. And she would go out to sell bananas, I think, and uh, foodstuffs to earn a little bit of money for, for the family, but couldn't afford school fees. So via the school, one of my staff members got to hear about Prince, who was extremely intelligent. He had written his uh, O-levels, which is four years of high school, and done extremely well, but couldn't come back to finish because of lack of funding. So we gave Prince a scholarship. Not only did we give him a scholarship so he could do his A-levels, but we partnered with Morehouse College in Atlanta, mm. and we gave 10 young men scholarships to study at Morehouse, and Prince qualified to get into Morehouse. He'll be graduating in May. I'll be at the graduation. Oh, so and he exciting. just got a scholarship. He's, he's a Rhodes Scholar, so he will be going to Oxford, Oxford. yeah, <laughs> to, to study there. So that's, uh, I think that's a brilliant story. Gives me chills. Story. Yeah. That's so great. <laughs> and your stories. What are your stories? Oh, my gosh. Um, for instance, I had a wonderful woman in the Congo who... When I visited her shelter for the first time, I think it was about six years ago, it was just the heart of poverty, and it was a rape center. She herself had been a horrible victim of rape. Her husband had been killed in front of her. Her two daughters had been raped, and now she ran this shelter that was just sort of a poorly constructed uh, building with dirt floors and no food. And at that time, six years ago, maybe there were about 40 adult women there and maybe mm, about 25 children, ranging in age from a few weeks old to probably eight or ten. And it was just poverty on a level that I hadn't seen before, and it was absolutely heartbreaking. And I'd gone there with Human Rights Watch, and we'd gone there that day to interview girls who had been raped. And I noticed throughout the day, like, the babies would be crying, and they would just sort of be rocked back to sleep. And I would think, oh, the baby's hungry, and then you'd realize there's just no food. And we got in the car and left at the end of the day. It was this really powerful day. And anyway, we, we started funding and immediately changed the predicament that Masika was in in that center and years went on and other funders jumped in and about a year about a year ago one of my friends from HRW that works in the Congo reached out to me and said oh I feel so horrible Amy because we just realized that for the past two years Masika has been getting funding from a couple other foundations and so you know, where someone would look at that as double dipping. And she said, you know, I'm not sure what she spent your money on. And I thought, I really don't care what this woman spent my money on because, A, it wasn't millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I would have done the same thing she would have done. Mm -hmm. I would have tried to get as much as I could because you have this endless stream of people with such great needs and you never know when the funding mm -hmm. you know from the states or wherever it's coming yeah. from is going to stop and I would have wanted to build up my bank account 
And I remember people saying, oh, sh- you know, you should have had more transparency or you should have asked for more paperwork. And I'm like you. I, I just don't. First of all, I have ADD, so I'm not going to read the paperwork. <laughs> and secondly, you know, I just don't think that we need to ask people that have such great needs mm-hmm. to even fill out a single mm-hmm. piece of paper. Mm-hmm. You can sort of see it, yeah. especially if you're privileged yeah. enough to travel that mm-hmm. far. Mm-hmm. Sadly, I'll say about... In February, Mystica died. She was very young still. She wasn't even 50. And, um, but I remember getting the news. And I was so proud of those chucks. Because I thought the world is a little bit darker place right now because Mystica's gone. And I was so glad that in my very tiny way, I made her life a little bit better. And then I was instantly reminded that I would need to step up and do a little bit more because when the world loses people like that, it requires the rest of us to step up and do a little bit more. Thank you for sharing, Amy. And Thank you for sharing that. Is that generally how you operate, Amy, in terms of um, you talk about visiting the Congo? Are you usually very hands-on with um, the people you give money to? You know, I'm not always, when I get an opportunity to, I try to take it because I think it's wonderful when you have the opportunity to travel and you get to see incredible work in the field. And actually, a lot of my philanthropy comes from when I'll be on a trip and then you'll get introduced to different groups and you'll see the work. I would like to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. I'm sure you might have some questions for our panelists. Ah, we're going to have a conversation first. We've never had a male voice on the conversation, so take it away. I'm Daniel Schwartz. I'm very moved by both the passion that you're both bringing to the table. In your work, what are the other tools that you're using? And you mentioned advocacy, you mentioned compassion and mentoring. How does that balance work? And how, what are the forces that you use to multiply the money that you're distributing and granting? I think there are a number of tools that I've had to learn to use over a period of time. The first one, networking. You can multiply yourself by finding other people who are doing or who can go to places you can go to or who have more effective voices than you have. And then secondly, uh, understanding you, you can't be all things to all men. There are only certain things you can do. Manage your ego because it's not about you. It's about the issues that we need to solve. Let others who are better positioned to do other things, let them do it and give them all the support that they need. And if that means that you lend your voice or you lend your money without ownership to that, uh, what they're doing, do it. So I, I'm an activist above everything. And, and you know, I, sometimes I put it ahead of mother and my kids are like, yes, yeah, say it ahead of mom. But um, <laughs> when I say I'm an activist, I, it so multiplies everything. I will never, you know, I'm not a gazillionaire. I've never taken my county, company public. I get to give away a pretty good size amount of money considering the world. But I'm not, you know, worth a billion dollars. So I think every day about how can I multiply everything I do. And I do it through activism. So I talk about causes every day, all day, everywhere I go. So it doesn't matter. And I still work full time. I have a tech company. I talk human rights at that company. I talk politics. I talk environment. I talk I talk it with customers. I talk it with vendors. When my kids were in school, that's what we talked about on the soccer field. That's what I talked about with their teachers. I never stop talking about those things because they actually matter. Mm-hmm. And I always give people what they can do because not everyone can write a big check. And most people, though, can write a small check, but some people can't. But what they can do is they can send emails, they can tell 10 people they know. I give away books all the time, and I give away basically human rights books. And I try to tell people all the time, you know, if you want to really make a difference in the world, get up every day and say, I'm just going to do three things today. And in those three, and that might just be three emails that you sent, or it might be three conversations or some sort of a mix. But if you get up every day and you consciously think about, doing an activity like that it doesn't even matter if you're on vacation you will make a difference and it greatly multiplies your ability to be a change maker in the world and behind that i come from brazil and we are leading a research on giving i see there are lots of women in this room and lots of women in philanthropy and do you think that women play a major role in that sense or is it because it's sometimes very emotional and we tend to 
allow ourselves to be more emotional than, than men, or is it just because of motherhood or whatever? The question of gender, I think it's a really important and fascinating one. And I was reading an article that was suggesting that women are better philanthropists because they're more engaged and connected with their causes. Would you agree with that, Susie? Oh, certainly. <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> I have a, a small sample to go by. I have one husband and one son. So <laughs> from my observations, I mean, my husband is very generous. But tell him to go to a community and experience the life in the community, uh-uh, no. <laughs> but I just think women, we are more practical, more, more hands-on, and more willing to, to do things that are pretty uncomfortable physically in order to understand how the other person feels and w what we can do. And then also, I think, Amy, you have the privilege of running your own business and being able to write the check. Now, I didn't come from that particular background. I didn't wake up having the ability to write checks. As a woman, I had to fight to get there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did that fight look like to you? Uh, it was, it, you know, it was, thank God it wasn't physical. <laughs> 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 it was just... Getting the other from my own husband to executives in the company to board members, you know, we decided, the two of us, that we wanted, when we started our business, when we make money, we want to give. But it's not something that is in the company annual report, that oh, when these people started from their humble beginnings, that's what they decided. Uh, it kind of like gets you know, disappears a little bit as the company becomes bigger and uh, more profitable and what have you. People tend to be more observant of how you're doing the giving and what have you and sometimes may not want to be as committed as they were. So what I found is that I wasn't encouraged to pursue what we had agreed to do when we started, that, listen, we are going to be giving away a lot of money. The male executives were very harsh, very difficult, very unsupportive, and sometimes it was a very lonely place to be. Sometimes I felt like I, you know, I, I was just a very strange and unreasonable person to want us to commit so much money where the return was change in the lives of people and not a financial return. So it was very difficult, and I also found it difficult to find mentors on the African continent that had been through what I'd been through because not so many families had really been entrepreneurs to the extent that we had become. So it was difficult. And sometimes also women would tell me, tone down, why, you, why do you want to be in the places where men normally are? You know, I, this, it's a different generation from your generation, right? So it was a lonely place to be. And sometimes I would want to go back and be like, do what all the other women were doing. Don't say anything. Don't ask. Who. Well, remember, we, have a, we agreed we would be giving. And when are we going to do it? And also the agreement that we do it together as a team, not because you're the one sitting in the boardroom. Those were the issues we had to navigate through. And, and, you know, sometimes I liked wisdom as a young woman. I would do it the wrong way, and you get punished for that. Oh, boy, you get into trouble. <laughs> but over time, I learned that you don't give up. You dig in. Eventually, you win. You overcome. It's easier for my five, five daughters because they've seen me make decisions. They've seen me create my own space. They've seen me fight for my rights as a wife, as a mother, as a an owner in the business. Mm -hmm. A lot of African women, let me tell you, have the, lots of successful entrepreneurs on the continent. But if you ask the wives, are you writing the check? Because that's where the power is. Mm -hmm. Do you have the ability to write a check if you see a need? Many of them don't. They still need to consult. Why? Because the guy believes that he's the one who owns the business and he's the one who has the right to making the final, having the final say. Now, no man is going to sit there and say, you know what, I suggest you also write the check. Why don't you? Maybe there's some guys who do that, m different from my generation, okay? But my generation, they're not going to do that. You have to be, you know, you've got to create your own sp space and, you know, and, and raise your own voice, create your, 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 your theme and your story until you get to where you need to get. So, yeah, it's not going to be easy. Also, I think going forward for uh, a lot of the philanthropists, um, especially women who are where the man is the one who's in the boardroom 
and who's the one who's, uh, I think, who's, who has the signature. It's, if you're not willing to be bold and to fight for what rightfully belongs to you, we're not going to be able to make some of the changes we want to see made. Thank you. <laughs> so I agree, and I think women are fabulous philanthropists because I often think that women, you know, presented with a problem, most of my girlfriends will get to the right answer much more quickly mm. than than the male counterpart. And I think that sometimes because women might just have extra scoopfuls of common sense when they were born. <laughs> or I think about running households, which is, you know, part of a lot of our lives. And, you know, we understand to, to forecast when we're going to be out of milk and how many meals have to be prepared for just the way we think through mm -hmm. things. And we actually are always thinking ahead. And we think about security. We think about education. We think about feeding our... And it's so easy to look at a humanitarian crisis or problem, learn about an organization, kind of hear what they're doing, oh, that makes sense, mm. and what's your budget, and how can I support? And I, so women, at least in my world, I find them to be just, the husband will eventually get there on the check, mm. Mm. she'll do it in two minutes, mm. he'll do it in two months. Mm. And I always wonder, like, what goes on in that period of time, right? Mm. And um, <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> Women are great philanthropists. <laughs> well, when you think, when I think of um, philanthropists, I think of uh, George Soros, I think of um, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Um, rightly or wrongly, I, these are the names that come to mind. Um, and I just wonder, I, I get the distinct impression that philanthropy seems to be the preserve of older white men. Do you think that's a fair impression? Um, Do you know loads of other women philanthropists? No, well, that's a that's a good point. I mean, I when I think of Bill Gates, I think of Melinda Gates, right. all equally, totally equally. In fact, I think of her more uh, when I think of the Gates Foundation than I think of him. But you're right. I'm trying to think of where's the uh, you know these are people of great wealth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're people of great wealth. That is the history of the world. We're working on changing that, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the history of the world. It hasn't been made by it's been built on the backs of people that don't look like them. Um, but that's, you know, you look at the richest people in history, and generally they, they have, that's what they look like. But that's changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just grateful that they're philanthropists mm -hmm. because I can think of plenty others that aren't. Mm -hmm. And that's sad. Hmm. I think it's also generational. The, that generation... Men had greater opportunity for entrepreneurship, access to uh, funds, to loans, greater credibility with uh, financial institutions, all s sorts of things. And women were more uh, regarded as, you know, uh, either be a profession or look after the kids. But when you look at the younger generation, it's not, it's not the same, I think, uh, Definitely, there you see a lot more uh, women who talk about uh, issues. They're not billionaires, but there's a lot more women who are talking and pushing for issues that are important in um, changing either negative cultural practices or social issues. Just for example, look at the, the voices around girls and women. It's got nothing to do with money. I mean, they, it's just women who are so bold. Uh, I look at organizations like uh, Girls Effect, Girls Rising, the Ch Chibok Girls. It's not billionaires who have brought those voices and brought awareness to the issues that girls are facing. It's just women who are very bold. So I think uh, uh, I like the balance that for the older generation, it's male, white, money. For the younger, it's about boldness. It's about audacity and the willingness to take a risk to tackle issues that other uh, that the older generation has not had the capacity to tackle. I like that. That is more about being bold than having billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, now you both have children. I 
think one of them's here actually. Oh, she is. There. The stories of these philanthropists leaving no money to their children um, because they want their children to make their own money. What's your philosophy? Uh, Sissy, I see you smiling, obviously. No, the reason um, why I'm laugh, <laughs> laughing and smiling is I think, uh, I don't know where you got that from. I think there are a few examples of, I think, extremely wealthy people who have said that. But I don't, I, I think it's more, that's what the media covers. Okay. Yeah, but I, I, I think different, there's so many people, there are so many philanthropists out there. Philanthropy is not synonymous with billionaire. I think we need to, it's just a term. And, and I think that lots of people were doing different things. Some are retiring and giving away their money after they've retired. Others are doing it as they are making the money. Others are pledging half their wealth uh, to give it all away and then part of it to their families. There isn't a one size fits all approach to how philanthropies are approaching that. But Wait, you haven't answered my question, though, Sissy. Yeah. I'm sure your daughter and I would love to know. <laughs> what is going, are you going to? Do you think you're going to leave um, some money to your children? Of course, you, of course. Oh, okay. definitely. Okay. Hey, you're gonna get some money, <laughs> definitely. So she can relax. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, what's your philosophy? Yeah, you know, like Sissy said earlier, I, we're very similar in the fact that it, it literally goes out the door as soon as it comes in. In mm-hmm. fact, I always say on, on I do believe in multi-year commitments because it does help a, a non-profit plan, but mm-hmm. I never can do gigantic multi-year commitments because mm-hmm. I say, oh, my gosh, what if next year isn't a good year? Um, because I always just try to give away every year as much as I can. I can tell you that I really hope my children, all five, um, end up having – careers where they have an ability to give away Mm. some amount and I'm sure all five of them will because none of them live tremendously large and you know my children they'll be there there I'll just be honest and they know it there won't be a lot left I always say I'm probably going to be broke at the end (laughs) you know a a few years ago I um, read mountains beyond mountains a few years ago I think the book came out about in 2001 or 2002 the Tracy Kidder book about Paul Farmer and for years Partners in Health was funded by one man out of Boston and he just sole funded it every year and you know they had a really small development staff and after a few years you know they added a couple and when that donor died he died about four years ago I think and in and he used to give him like a half million a year or a million a year and in the last year of his life they'd gotten the last check-in from him about two months before he died and it was fifteen hundred dollars and he wrote a note and he apologized. He said he wished it would have been more, but it was all he had left. And I just get so moved by that and so moved and just think, you know, we're just so lucky to have it to be able to give it away. So I don't think about my children having plush lives or more than a house. I hope they have a house. Um, I'll help in all in any ways I can. But I expect them, you know, to make their way in the world and to give away as much as they can. Amy and Sitsi, thank you both very much for joining us on the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've been hearing about the world of philanthropy from Sitsi Masiwa, a Zimbabwean philanthropist who is the co-founder and co-chair of an education non-profit that's helped tens of thousands of children to get an education. My other guest, Amy Rao, is a prolific philanthropist with a wide variety of causes, including human rights and environmental awareness. My thanks to them both, and a big thanks to my audience for their questions too. Now, before I go, remember we have a weekly podcast, which you can subscribe to for free. All you have to do is search online for BBC The Conversation. Click on subscribe and you'll get a sparkling new conversation each week delivered directly to you. Happy listening. Till next time.